Hello. Today, I'd like to talk to you about AI and the future of architectural education. And I'd like to do so within the context of AI and the future of the discipline and profession of architecture itself. Of course, we all know what AI can do, at least we know from these um, diffusion platforms such as Midjourney, DALI, Stable Diffusion, and so on, that it can produce images such as this one. And I, like many people, have been exploring the extraordinary potential of these platforms. They're able to generate remarkable images. And I, like, like many people, I've been completely blown away by the quality of the images, how the originality of the images, how the fact that you can produce these so quickly and without really necessar necessarily having a, a, a strong background in technology. They are, in many ways, game changers. They allow us to produce designs and buildings as good as those of any office, such as our Hadid architects. Anyone can effectively do this, and including offices such as Zahadid architects themselves. Even though Zaha is no longer with us, they're able to produce these astonishing designs. This is done in collaboration with Refik Anadol. But I would argue that remarkable as these, these platforms are, they are just a distraction from the main question about what AI itself can do beyond AI image generation. Recently, there was a, an exhibition held in Texas architecture after AI, where they showed a whole series of these images. But the title itself was a bit misleading. Architecture after AI, is AI ever going to go, be a, go away? My thinking is that maybe AI after architecture, after the end of architecture might be a much more relevant uh, topic. So before I address the question of the profession itself, let's just look at what's been happening in AI itself. And the, 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 the company, the startup that's been behind all of these things has been OpenAI. Uh, it's based in Silicon Valley uh, in California. And that's the one that provided us with DALI and from which Midjourney and others emerged. Uh, and that's the one also that produced us, that produced ChatGPT, this remarkable um, chatbot that is really trans transforming the world that was only launched in November of 2022. And let's take into account that technology, the speed of change of technology is exponential. At the moment, apparently, it's going twice the speed of Moore's law, and we are really rocketing ahead. I first became alerted to the potential of uh, ChatGPT not long after it had been launched. Uh, I was watching the, uh, the, the football match, the quarterfinals of the World Cup between Brazil and Croatia, that Croatia won on the penalties. And what was remarkable about this particular match is that this player, Neymar from Brazil, probably the best player in the Brazilian team, never got to take a pen his penalty because he was number five on the list. And by that time, Brazil had already, lo already lost. One of my Brazilian colleagues, so incensed that they hadn't chosen him to take the first penalty, consulted ChatGPT on who should have been taken the first penalty. And it, of course, it said it should be Neymar. Now that was interesting because I thought to myself, if it can tell you that, then it can tell you all sorts of other things. It could tell an architect what materials to specify for a building or indeed a non-architect what materials to specify for a building. All of a sudden, a Pandora's box of possibilities presented itself. And it wasn't long after that, then BARD, um, the, the Google version of ChatGPT was launched on the 6th of February, quite remarkable. And then the very next day, Microsoft announces that it's going to uh, it's going to team up with uh, with OpenAI so that Bing, its search engine, will have uh, will, will be uh, using the possibilities of ChatGPT. In other words, as uh, compared to Google, that just gives us a, a series of references, Microsoft's Bing with ChatGPT is going to give us the actual answers, and that will be a serious game change. Of course, the, pro the problem right now with uh, ChatGPT is that it's only 80% accurate, but that's going to change. As things develop, of course, we're going to get systems that are far more effective, far more reliable, and are going to give us answers that are approaching 100% accuracy. Of course, uh, the, uh, uh, so what we're going to see then is a complete change in, in how we search for information. We're going to get actual facts. We're going to get actual answers. And of course, Google are going to try and compete 
with, uh, with Microsoft and produce one that's going to produce even better answers. So uh, not, uh, just recently, even more recently, um, uh, GPT-4 was released um, on the 14th of March 2023, and that is vastly superior to, to uh, uh, GPT-3. GPT-4 is going to make, uh, make the GPT way more powerful and, and, and connected with ChatGPT, Chat GPT, it's going to be extraordinary what it's going to produce. But alongside that, of course, there is something a little bit scary about this. Um, AI is very, very capable, but also terrifyingly capable. Um, and and uh, Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, perhaps wasn't the first person, certainly wasn't the first person to recognize this. Elon Musk had recognized it long ago. We need to be super careful with AI, potentially more dangerous than nukes, nuclear weapons. And the other problem about AI is that human beings cannot imagine the possibility of machine being smarter than, it, than them. And, and here is a very interesting discussion between Jack Ma and Elon Musk. And Jack Ma makes the mistake, in my opinion, of, of taking this position. I never in my life say human beings will be controlled by machines. It's impossible. Human beings can never create another thing that is smarter than human beings. And Elon Musk corrects him. I very much disagree with that. The biggest mistake I see people making is to assume they're smart. People underestimate the capability of AI. They sort of think it's like a smart human, but it's going to be much smarter than the smartest human you will ever know. And these changes are speeding up. So what about the profession and the discipline of architecture? What impact will AI have on architecture? The death of the architect has already been announced. Back in 2015, way before the introduction of AI, FAT, fashion architecture, taste, uh, now disbanded uh, architectural practice, got together to announce this um, and bemoaning a profession that essentially was already struggling even before the arrival of AI. Uh, and after them, a series of, of, of books came out, including this one by Richard and Daniel Suskin on the future of the professions, where they point out that the the, the agreement that happens right now, the kind of gentleman's agreement whereby architects become the gatekeepers, they police their own profession, and likewise lawyers and medics and so on, that will end fairly soon. When it comes down to it, all this, uh, these, these agreements will be overridden by economic requirements, and we can expect to see every single profession touched in some way by the impact of AI. Now, we've all seen these images of the factory floor of a Tesla factory, for example, where there's not a human being in sight. They're simply robotic arms. And we, could, we might be tempted to think that it's going to be here in manual labor that technology is going to have its biggest impact, not in terms of kind of intellectual pursuits like architectural design and so on, but we would be wrong. The point is this, that robots still struggle to do very simple tasks such as selecting a brick and picking it up and placing it in the right place. Whereas AI has been racing ahead with remarkable advances over the past few months. It seems that it's not the, the factory workers, but the professionals, the architects, the lawyers, the doctors and so on, who are most at risk from these technologies. When it comes to architecture also, we should beware of being trapped by this world of images and thinking that's the answer. Architecture goes way beyond images. And, and it's the systems that have been developed right now by companies such as X Cool in Shenzhen, who are who are now in the process of producing software that's going to be radically transform the profession that are really going to be the game changers. In three to five years' time, where there's going to be a system that works from data to fabrication, in which everything is on one coordinated platform and operates seamlessly. And that is itself going to be have a huge impact on, on how we operate as architects. We don't know quite when it's going to come through, just as we don't know when the, the, the self-driving cars will be fully reliable, but we know that eventually they will be. And alongside that, in, in the, on the west coast of the States, we have Spacemaker, recently acquired by Autodesk. And what's interesting about some of the findings that they've come up with is that they found examples of AI being able to generate solutions that no human being would have thought of themselves. In fact, they wouldn't even have recognized them. And this is the point. Effectively, AI is able to operate at a level far higher than human beings, far higher than human architects. 
Recently, I published an article in Dezine pointing out the risk about this, the danger effectively of AI taking over our jobs. Now, the point is this, it's not just simply a one-for-one -one replacement of AI replacing a single architect. Rather, the issue is how one person with AI can, can, can perform the tasks of many people not using AI. I once heard someone working in this field saying that one person using AI could do the tasks of five people not using AI. Does that mean that 80% of architectural jobs will be, will be made redundant? 80% of all architects will be made redundant? Who knows? But the interesting response to this article was that those who were working in AI said, yes, of course. And those who weren't working in AI said, I can't believe this. I, I, there's not a single AI, AI out there that, can, that has quite the ingenuity, the creativity, and the imagination that I have. Well, I suspect that they're probably wrong. My next book in my series, um, uh, the first book is on the left-hand side, Architecture in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. The next book is going to be called The Death of the Architect, The Demise of the Architectural Profession in the Age of AI. It's not that AI is the only factor. The profession itself is already struggling. So I then consulted ChatGPT to give me a comment on the future of architects. And this is what it came up with, a somewhat scary prediction. In the near future, architects may become a thing of the past. AI is quickly advancing to a point where it can generate the design of a building completely autonomously. This could spell the end of the profession as we know it, raising questions of what the future holds for architects in a world of AI-generated buildings. Architects who choose to ignore AI will be left behind and ultimately forgotten as the industry evolves and advances. Therefore, it is imperative that architects pay attention to AI and its potential to revolutionize architecture, or they risk sleepwalking into a So let's also think about the whole question of licensing. How is this going to impact upon the licensing of the architect? This is the Royal Institute of British Architects in London, um, who actually have been quite uh, progressive in trying to predict, as it were, the future uh, of the architectural profession. In 2013, they, they, uh, they, they, they launched an inquiry looking at this kind of question. They came up with this report. Interestingly, what they noticed is that, that, that architects already are struggling in the sense that uh, only more than 50% of all building contracts in the UK are now design build contracts. In other words, the architect, uh, instead of being in charge as we used to be, we're now working directly for the contractor. More, more, moreover, certain architects are being forced to diversify, to go to, to undertake industrial design, product design, and other forms of employment to the point that actually the term architect is itself not necessarily so useful. In 10 years, we probably will co not call ourselves we will not call ourselves an architectural practice. It will be something else entirely. And in any case, only 5% of all buildings are designed by architects. So how effective have these institutions been in protecting the profession of architecture? The question also arises when we discover that uh, firms such as XCool have been asked to um, evaluate uh, entries for competitions. Now, that means that basically they also could use AI to generate designs for the competition. But then if you think about it even further, what it suggests is that, is that AI could be used to, 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 to conform to a whole series of different constraints. One could use AI to conform to, to building codes, to planning constraints, to environmental considerations, to structural considerations, to um, acoustic performance, to indeed the whole question of cost, everything could be written into that platform. Moreover, you haven't got to test it because it's already conforming to those constraints. So what would be the need of put, submitting it for a planning proposal when it's already conforming to all those considerations? And why would we need to have these architects who carefully preserve their name as architects when really it's all going to be about the performance of the building itself? Are we even going to need to be licensed in the future? 
I also I put this question also to, uh, to ChatGPT. The emergence of AI is set to revolutionize the field of architecture, challenging traditional notions of licensure and, and its expertise. With AI's ability to analyze vast amounts of, of data, generate complex designs, and optimize building performance, it's no surprise that some are questioning the need for human architects to be licensed. As AI becomes more sophisticated, it will undoubtedly continue to disrupt the, uh, the architectural profession, leading to, a prof leading to a future where the role of licensed architects may be drastically reduced, if not altogether eliminated. Sobering words, indeed. So what about the future of education? I mean, what is obvious, first of all, is that if we're not going to need so many architects, we are not going to need so many architectural students. I'm not sure if the, the amount of architects is going to be reduced so substantially that 80% will be out of work, but if it were, that would have a dramatic impact on architectural institution. And of course, also, on the professors, because if you only have 20% uh, of the, the numbers you had before, that means you only need 20% of your professors. And presumably also, this would have, have a, a disproportionate um, impact on certain schools. The leading schools, such as the Architectural Association in London, shown here, might be immune from all these changes, but the, low, the weaker schools, the ones lower down the ranking, will inevitably suffer, and undoubtedly, some of them Will, will close, be forced to close. And you also get the, 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 the impact of chat GPT. That is having an enormous impact uh, in, in the world of, uh, uh, of education. First of all, obviously, uh, if chat GPT is giving you advice that a professor would, ordinarily, would normally have otherwise given you, um, but maybe the professor's role becomes slightly different. It's having an enormous impact on certain things. So let me just play you Jordan Peterson, um, a Canadian academic who uh, uh, gives us a warning about the real potential of chat GPT in the field of education. How many of you clap? How many of you know what chat GPT is? There are things, and everyone on, in the audience should know this, there are things coming down the pipeline on the artificial intelligence front that are just gonna make your hair stand on end within the next year. Because there is so much transformation going on in that domain. And, and that's been the case, particularly for the last six months, that it's, it's almost unimaginable. I figure a third of the universities will go broke in the next five years. So I'll tell you what chat GPT is, just so you know, because you need to know this. And I don't know what sort of technological revolution this is. It's smarter than you. This is a big deal. So this AI system, it's a general language processing model, was released about a week ago, a week and a half ago. And uh, I, I went and interacted with it. You can, it's an AI system, artificial intelligence system. It basically is trained on, well, a massive corpus of, of spoken and, or of text. So it's derived its models of the world from the analysis of human speech, essentially. It, it isn't using real-world data yet, but that will be happening certainly within the next year. And ChatGPT analyzes a very large corpus of text, and that corpus is growing all the time. Now, it's already sophisticated enough. I went on to it last week, and I said, okay, some of you know I, I've written these books, 12 Rules for Life, and then Beyond Order, 12 More Rules, because, you know, you can't have enough rules. And I asked it, this is what I asked it to do. I said, write me an essay that's a 13th rule for beyond order, written in a style that combines the King James Bible with the Tao Te Ching. That's pretty difficult to pull off, you know? Any one of those things is hard. The intersection of all three, that's impossible. Well, it wrote it in about three seconds, four pages long, and it isn't obvious to me, for better or worse, that I would be able to tell that I didn't write it. Right, right, and okay, and that's pretty impressive, but the fact that it could do that grammatically perfectly, right, and quite impressive philosophically, I also had it write an essay on the intersection between the Taoist version of ethical morality and the 
ethics that are outlined in the Sermon on the Mount, which it just nailed, got that dead right, Br brilliant. Again, it took it about three seconds. There was a, a computer engineer who purported to work for Tesla. He asked GPT, chat GPT, he said, look, I work for Elon Musk, but I haven't been doing much for the last week, so I need you to write me 10 bullet points about what I probably would have done as a, as a engineer at Twitter. What 10 things did I do last week that were productive and valuable? And oh, if you don't mind, write me the accompanying computer code that goes with each project. And it did that too, three seconds, and the computer code works. Right, and so, okay, so that's, that's already there. So then a university professor did this. He thought, oh, that's interesting. Any student will be able to write any essay on any topic with chat GPT. And uh, someone gave it an SAT, by the way, and it scored about as well as the average student in a well-functioning public university. So that's how smart it is. So that's basically an IQ test. He said, write me an essay, gave it a topic, wrote the essay. He said, now grade it said, if we can automate the students, we should be able to automate the professors, too. And so it provided a complete comprehensive analysis of its own essay with grade. It wrote, uh, someone else asked it, write the screenplay and describe the characters for the next $900 million Hollywood blockbuster. It's like, bang, plot, characterizations. Then someone else took the descriptions of the actors and said, generate computer, photorealistic computer images for each actor. And all the AI systems could do that. So I'm going to tell you what's going to happen next. This is going to happen this year. So get ready. Okay, so now we have an AI model that can extract a model of the world from the entire corpus of language. All right, and it's, it's smarter than you. And it's going to be a hell of a lot smarter than you in two years. So you can get ready for that too. But it's not that smart yet because it's just a humanities professor at the moment. It doesn't test its linguistic knowledge against the real world. That's what a scientist does, right? You come up with a theory that's linguistically predicated and then you throw it against the world and see if it sticks. And then the world tells you whether or not your linguistic construction is valid. But the new AI systems will be able to extract out patterns from the world itself, from images and so forth, and then be able to test their linguistic constructions against the world and so they'll practice just like scientists and the most advanced models are going to use text and image and action as well because they'll be able to model human action and so and all of that's going to come down the pipes within the next year so hang on to your hats ladies and gentlemen because what did my friend Jonathan Pajot say giants are going to walk the earth once more and we're going to live through that in Elon Musk. Remarkable, remarkable. Of course, ChatGPT has already caused a stir in educational circles. In New York, they, the schools banned the use of, uh, of ChatGPT. But you're, you're left wondering how effective is that ban going to be? Um, I mean, there are going to be, uh, there, there apparently there's some, there's some algorithms that can detect whether you use ChatGPT, but there are going to be other algorithms that are going to be obscure that. There are also going to be many other platforms appearing that will eventually uh, also compete with ChatGPT. But beyond that, you've also got to ask, well, what is the point of banning it? This reminds me of the situation not so long ago when calculators were first introduced and they were banned from mathematics exams. But you have to ask yourself, well, what's you, once you've got calculators, why do you need to, uh, to do long division? Uh, why, why do you need to do all these performances? Why can't you simply just use the calculators? And once you've got ChatGPT, why can't you use it to uh, produce um, essays and things? Let me uh, show you briefly um, uh, an excerpt of, uh, of, of some work that some of my students produced back in October, where they were using AI uh, to in, in several different ways. To first of all, generate a text, then to give a voice to those texts, and then also to provide images to go alongside them. We're running out of resources. We're running out of space and we're running out of time. There are AI skyscrapers and skyscrapers in space, wormholes and starship ships. Human beings, robots, and cyborgs make up the environment. The cyborgs control every aspect of the ship, including the core computer. From communicating with the aliens to operating the factory and looking after the cyborgs. And so on. 
So uh, in the future, it seems to me the challenge is not to ban the use of AI, but to try and encourage the students to really make most to make the most of it, to be able to use it in a way that is that is most productive. But there's another question. Beyond the use of AI itself, it strikes me that education as we have it is a, follows a model that is absolutely and completely obsolete. Here we have a professor in a classroom, perhaps not an architectural professor, but a professor, and he's teaching a small group of students. Now you have to ask yourself whether this is the most efficient way to operate in a world where we now have these platforms, such as Zoom and so on, that enable us to connect with the rest of the world. Why, do, why can't we simply share a platform? And not only share a platform, but not just have an ordinary professor, but have the very best professor out there. Besides which, you could claim that in any case, there is far more information out there on the internet, on YouTube and so on, than any professor could possibly be able to master. In other words, the old one of the professor professing, of passing on this information that is within his or her brain, is completely obsolete because nobody can compete with YouTube. Rather, we need some kind of professor that is able to be a kind of curiosity stimulator that might be able to steer students in the right direction. We've begun to recognize this on digital futures. What digital futures, what we do is, is use our online platform to basically embrace students throughout the world. What we discovered with COVID when we launched the Digital Future Summer Festival online, completely online, is that we could use our online platform to break through not only the physical walls of the classroom, but also the social, economic, and political barriers that have prevented certain individuals from having, having access to education in the first place. Education for us should be a, a universal human right and not a privilege of the wealthy. So the challenge was, how could we share that information? And by using this platform, we could overcome not that, only that, but also we could produce the very best professors in the world. We could bring them from along and create a course taught by, for everyone by the very best in the world. We could have Akin Menges teaching the, the, a, a, giving a lecture on robotics. We could have, I don't know, Daniel Bolojan giving a lecture on AI and so on. So initially we started off with a doctoral consortium, this idea that we could have this, a platform for, for PhD students across the world. Um, and why not? Because typically PhD students will operate in small numbers. We could have one, a universal one for doctoral candidates all over the world, but that model could apply to all aspects of education. In terms of, uh, of AI itself, it is even more imperative to try and find an alternative way of operating because things, are changing on a daily basis. And which professor, which individual professor has access to that kind of information? This is from a course that we set up, um, an introduction to AI for designers, where we brought the very best professors in to talk about these new developments as they're happening. And this is a particular uh, uh, tutorial offered by Arturo Tedeschi, one of the leading figures in the world, certainly of Grasshopper, and also in terms of computation in general, where he's teaching everyone how to connect ChatGPT with Grasshopper. It seems to me that education isn't a crisis point. It is following a model that is deeply obsolete. In architecture, we're producing possibly too many students, too many graduates for a profession that is shrinking. So I put the question to ChatGPT, what, how should uh, uh, architecture education evolve in the future? And here is the response. With the emergence of AI-powered design tools and techniques, the need for tra traditional architectural education is rapidly diminishing. And it is not inconceivable that it may disappear entirely. As AI algorithms become more sophisticated and capable of, of performing complex tasks, they can automate the entire design process from conceptualization to construction. This means that architects may no longer need to spend years honing their craft through rigorous education and training, as AI technology continues to advance, architects may become a relic of the past, replaced by, by, the, by intelligent machines that can design and build structures with greater efficiency and precision, precision than humans ever could. Sobering words indeed. I'm going to finish, though, 
just by simply passing on information about the course, the tutorial series of tutorials that on digital futures we have been um, offering uh, every Saturday. This is a course with, um, with, with systematically looks at the whole question of how you can AI, use AI in the field of design and introduction to AI for designers. And if you go to our um, digital futures website, you go, or our YouTube library, you can see all of these uh, tutorials recorded. And if you want to go and follow up by uh, following digitalfutures.world on Instagram or myself, Neil Leach's, Neil Leach 14 on Instagram, you will get regular updates on the tutorials that we're offering. Thank you.